2 Corinthians chapter 9. And usually I teach from verses 6 on through about verse 10, 2 Corinthians chapter 9. And let me just refer to them and say that this is talking about how that we're supposed to give cheerfully. We're supposed to give as we purpose in our own heart. Verse 8 is a major passage of scripture and it says, God is able to make all grace abound towards you so that you always having all sufficiency in all things may abound unto every good work. Verse 10 is really powerful when it says that God gives seed to the sower and bread to the eater. God gives money to people who will sow it, not people who will eat it. If you're short of money, it's because God doesn't see you as a giver. He sees you as a taker, an eater. Now, givers have to eat too, so God's not opposed to you having things, but I'm saying that your heart cry ought to be, you live to give, not give to live. There's a difference between those two. And I normally focus on those, but yeah, I want to go down to the very last verse in 2 Corinthians chapter 9 and in verse 15, it says, thanks be unto God for his unspeakable gift. And if you take this in its context, all of chapter eight and all of chapter nine is talking about money and about giving. He started in the very first verses of chapter eight, talking about you're one of the poorest groups and yet you abounded in liberality and generosity more than anybody else. So much so that he asked Titus to take the things that had happened in the Corinth church and, and share them with other people because these people were givers, even though they were poor, it's giving isn't dictated by whether you have a lot of money or not. It's an attitude of the heart. And anyway, He talked about giving throughout this entire thing, but he summarized it and ended it all by saying, thanks be unto God for his unspeakable gift. And you know, this is really what giving is all about. Giving is just a tangible way of saying thank you and saying, God, we love you. How could you put a price on what God has done in your life? You know, if you had to buy a salvation, you can't buy it. It's a gift. But if you had to buy it, what would, what would it cost to have your sins forgiven, to be healed, to be delivered, to have God love you and to answer your prayers and uh, guarantee that when you die, you're going to go to a better place and you're going to be with the Lord and all of the benefits of salvation. I guarantee it's worth every penny that we've ever had, ever comes across our path. If if we gave everything we had to God and had to live on the street under a bridge, it would still be a deal. (laughs) And you know what? Giving is just a tangible expression, a tangible way of saying, thank you, Father. And I'm going to make a statement. Some of you may disagree with this, but... You're entitled to your opinion, but I won't agree with you or we'd both be wrong. (laughs) But did you know if you aren't a cheerful, radical giver, you are not a thankful Christian. People who really understand what Jesus has done and have any revelation of it, I guarantee you they give. It's just a small way of trying to give back. But if you truly understood what Jesus has done for you, it makes you want to give. It makes you want to be a blessing. If you have been blessed, then you want to be a blessing. It's the heart of God. God so loved the world that he gave. God is a giver. And when you really connect with God, this same heart of giving to where it's not about you receiving It's not like a vacuum cleaner that you're just sucking everything towards you. You turn it around and reverse it to where you are giving and you want to be a blessing to people. That is the heart of God. And this is what Paul summarized. After talking about all of this giving, he says, thanks be unto God for his unspeakable gift. And you know, that's what we're doing when we give in an offering. We're just saying, Father, thank you. Thank you for the awesome things, for the unspeakable gift that you've given. And so as we give this morning, I want you to just give with a thankful heart. The Lord said he loves a cheerful giver. You know, if you're giving grudgingly and of necessity, and if you're giving because you're wondering what the person next to you is going to think, and so you put something in just to make it look like it, but you didn't want to give anything, just keep it. You need it more than I need it. 
I encourage you to give with a cheerful heart and just give in thanksgiving and say thanks be unto God for his unspeakable gift. Isn't that awesome? And you know, the money that you give, what we're doing with this, it takes us, I don't know, it's a million dollar. How much do we pay in TV and airtime? It's about a million dollars. So it's, it's just under a million dollars a month. We pay in actual television and airtime. And then it takes us another million a month and to have the staff and to put out all of the materials and the phones and the computers and everything like this. But your giving is enabling us to reach 3.2 million, or excuse me, billion people a day with the gospel. Isn't that awesome? So when you give, you are helping us reach all around the world. So Father, we love you and we thank you for this opportunity. And we just want to say thanks for the awesome things that you've done, for the wonderful salvation. And we could never repay you, but we want to give to help express and expose other people to these truths and see their lives changed. And so, Father, we thank you for it. And we believe that for every person that gives, that you will multiply this back unto them supernaturally so that they can prosper. And we receive that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Praise God. You can receive the offer. Oh, if you need an offering envelope, I forgot to say that. If you need an offering envelope, Hold your hand up. Our ushers will get you an envelope. This is primarily for cash giving. There's a place that you can fill out your name and address and we'll get you a tax deductible receipt. And there's a place on there that you can give by credit card. If you're giving by a check, you can make it out to Andrew Womack Ministries or AWM. And that'll be good. Praise God. So I broke the routine. After they pass out these offering envelopes, then we'll come back and receive the offering. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. You know, I know that there's a lot of people that think, man, you're dealing with a lot of money and my little gift doesn't make any difference. It's really not about, you know, your gift and, and our need. I don't know if you pay attention to this, but most ministers, when they stand up, will tell you what their needs are and then ask you to give. I do a little teaching about how this blesses you and how this is for you and stuff. And it's not about my need. It's about your opportunity to give. And I I receive offerings to bless you. Did you know the money that comes in at these meetings is a very small portion of our income? We don't do these meetings to make money. We do these meetings to bless people. And I receive offerings because it's good for you. It blesses you. So don't worry about what our needs are or anything. You just do what God tells you to do and you'll be prospered. Amen. Y'all can go ahead and pass the offering buckets. Sorry I threw you off. You got to be flexible. You know, I went and ministered at a little church. This guy was a graduate of our Bible school and he had a church up in the mountains of Colorado with about 20 or 30 people in it. And three churches went together. So all together, there was a hundred people in this meeting and three churches went together, held a meeting in one, one of the pastor's churches and they asked me to come and minister. And, um, it was a small group and they were afraid that I wouldn't get very much of an offering. So they said, you take up the offerings, you receive your own offerings. And I think the logic was that if I was the one that received the offerings, I couldn't complain about whatever it was. So anyway, I got up and I started by saying that I just came from Charlotte, North Carolina. That's where Pastor Darian and Karen are from. And their church had just given me $50,000 for a week-long meeting. And I said, I'm not a poor preacher that got into town and I just barely made it. And you got to please help me get out of town. I said, I don't need your money. And when I said that, you should have seen the face of this pastor on the front row. It was like, you just killed the offering. (laughs) Nobody's going to give. And I began to teach him. I said, it's not about what I need. This is an opportunity for you to invest in God's kingdom. This is an opportunity for you to start a supernatural flow. And before I got up at every service, I just taught the people on how to give. And anyway, the pastor called me the next week. And he said, that was the largest offering we have ever received in the history of our church. And he said, not only 
did it, you know, produce a, a large offering, but he says, it just changed my life. He says, I can't remember what your messages were, but I can remember those offering talks. <laughs> and he knew those truths himself, but he was afraid to say it to the people because when a preacher goes to talking about money, they think you're doing it so that you can get their money. They don't understand that you're saying it to help the people. And he hadn't shared these truths with his church because he was afraid of how people would perceive it. And so he just, he hadn't done it. And anyway, after I left, on the Sunday after I left, he got up in front of his church and there was only 20 or 30 people in his church when the three churches split and went their own ways. And he got up and he stood in front of his group and he apologized to him. And he says, I have not shared the truth with you. He says, I haven't been telling you these things because I was afraid of how people would perceive it. And there's only a small number of people. And I thought, you know, I can't expect to get all of this. And he, he just got down on his knees and cried and apologized to the people and said, I'm sorry for not sharing the truth with you. And the people responded so well. They started running up and hugging him and they started throwing money on the platform. And this little group of 20 or 30 people took up over $30,000 in a spontaneous offer and paid off all of the church's debt and enabled them to support things. And this guy said, this has transformed our church. Isn't that awesome? I tell you, trusting God and being uh, faithful in your finances is a very, very important part of the Christian life. And most people do not understand how important that is. So let's turn back over to Romans chapter six. For those of you that have not been here, I started with Romans chapter five, verse 12. And I spent the first two services uh, ministering from Romans chapter five. Primarily, we focused on Romans chapter five, verses 17 and verses 21. Let me just go back and read them. It says, for if by one man's offense, death reigned by one, much more they which receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one Jesus Christ. Verse 21, that as sin hath reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. I had a man come up today who said he believed God could do anything. And he believed all of this. And he believed the things that I was saying, but he just couldn't get it working in his life. And I quoted this verse to him. And I said, see, you believe in the grace of God, but you aren't seeing it reign, dominate control your life because you don't understand your righteousness, your righteous position. And so this is what I've been talking about is about what God did and how we've been changed. And this led us into Romans chapter six last night. And I didn't get uh, as far into this as I thought I would, but in Romans chapter six, the logical uh, qu question to all of this teaching is, are you just saying that it's all God's grace? He's not dealing with us based on our performance. So can we just live in sin? Is it, does it matter how we live? And Paul said, absolutely not. Unqualified, negative, no, that's not what I'm saying. And he gave two reasons in Romans chapter six why people don't live in sin. The first one is what we talked about last night. And that is that you are dead to sin. This does not mean you are incapable of sin. You can still sin. Christians do sin. But again, I go back to one of the first points that I made that there is a difference between an action of sin and your sin nature. This is saying we are dead to our sin nature. When you got in Christ, you were baptized into, your, into his death and your old sin nature died. You do not have a nature any longer that is part devil and compels you to live in sin. And the logical question to that is people say, well, then why do I sin so much? Because your old man, this old nature left behind an unrenewed mind. It programmed your brain like a computer and you are still continuing to function the way that you were programmed. And very few Christians have reprogrammed their mind. This is what Romans chapter 12, verse two says, don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is the good and the acceptable and the perfect will of God. 
When you get born again, your spirit is completely changed. It's identical to the Lord Jesus Christ. You have his faith, his power, his anointing, his resurrection life. Everything that is needed for the Christian life is already in your born again spirit, but it has to go into your physical body through your mind. And if you are still thinking that you're only human, if you're still thinking that cancer is stronger than you, and that's true in the natural, but it's not true in the spirit. Your spirit man is stronger than cancer. Your spirit man is stronger than grief. Your spirit man is stronger than anything. People come up and tell me all of their problems. And I often ask them, I said, and so why do you let this happen? And they just look at me like, well, I don't have power against this. That's a person that is seeing themselves as an old creature. They don't know who they are in Christ. And the reason grace isn't reigning unto eternal life is because they don't know their righteous position. They don't know who they are. They don't know their authority. I'm telling you, there is no reason for Christians to be living the defeated life. There is no reason when cancer knocks at your door for you just to run to God. No, God, heal me as if you have no power. You got the power that raised Jesus from the dead. And that's more than enough to heal cancer. That's more than enough to heal whatever's wrong with you. That's more than enough to take care of whatever your problem is. But very few people understand their righteous position and their change that is taken in their spirit. And so grace isn't releasing its full effect and power in their life because they don't know who they are in Christ. Well, that's a mouthful. But that's what we've been talking about. And so Romans chapter six says, you're dead to sin. That old sin nature is non-existent. The only reason that Christians sin is because you were programmed to sin by your sin nature and very few people have reprogrammed themselves. They still see themselves as bitter, angry, selfish, on and on and on and it goes. I tell you, you can reprogram yourself with the word of God and literally change all of these things. In your heart, you have a desire to live for God. You know, this is a little bit of a sideline, but this is one of the ways that you can tell if you're truly born again. Not necessarily how successful you are, but many of you, before you got born again, you slept around with other people. You were angry, bitter, you gossiped, you did this and that. And you know what? After you're born again, you still do some of the same things, but now you feel terrible about it. And before you didn't feel terrible about it. You know what the difference is? Your nature has changed. You no longer like it. You may still do some of the same stuff, but now you feel bad about it because the nature that is on the inside of you hates those kind of things. But you're going to wind up still submitting to the things until you renew your mind and get and find out the power and the authority that you have and stuff. And people are just continuing Uh, in sin because they don't know who they were. So anyway, this is what we've talked about. And we got down to Romans chapter six. Let me back up and just read a few of these verses. You have to know some things. The death with Christ, the death to the old man is automatic. But whether or not you see resurrection power flow through your mind and into your body and into your experience is dependent upon you knowing some things. So look in verse nine. Here's one of the things you have to know that you have to know that Christ being raised from the dead dieth no more. Death hath no more dominion over him. Man, that is a strong statement. And all of us recognize this with Jesus, but then we think differently about ourselves. We know that Jesus has overcome death, but we aren't sure that we have. You have to get the same attitude. Matter of fact, over in first Peter chapter four, I believe it's verse one. It says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Man, that is a strong statement. You're supposed to think the way that Jesus thinks. And then it goes on to say, have you got that verse to put up there? Let me turn over and read this. I'm not sure I quoted exactly. I think it's first Peter chapter four. In verse one, it says, for as much then as Christ has suffered for us in the flesh. This means that everything he did was for us. It wasn't for him. Jesus didn't suffer because of his sin. He suffered because of our sin. So everything he did is for us. Therefore, we can take advantage of everything that he accomplished. For as much then as Christ has suffered for us in the flesh, 
arm yourself likewise with the same mind. We need to think the way that Jesus thinks. And here it goes on to uh, describe it. It says, for he that has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. Did you know religion will also often interpret this as you need to suffer? And the more you suffer in life, this is why trials, tribulations, sickness, disease, and things like this come. And as you suffer, then you cease from sin. It helps you to overcome sin. And you have entire denominations that talk about the more you suffer, the holier you are. That is not true. That is not what this is talking about. If that was true, then the people who've suffered the most would be the holiest. That's not true. This is talking about Jesus is the one that suffered in the flesh and he has ceased from sin. It's the exact same thing that Romans is talking about when it says that sin has no more dominion over him. He submitted himself briefly to sin and suffered the effects of God's wrath and punishment upon sin. But he died to sin once and he's not dying anymore. Sin has no more dominion over him. And it's saying, get the same attitude that you are now absolutely free from sin is what this is talking about. So he that has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin that he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh to the lust of man, but to the will of God. You know, I hesitate to say some things that I really believe because people think I'm weird enough as it is. And if I tell you, (laughs) but you know what? I don't see sin as one category and then poverty and depression and sickness and things like this in another category. All of those things are the result of sin. I hate sickness as much as I hate adultery. I hate poverty as much as I hate lying or stealing. There are some of you that wouldn't go commit adultery because that's sin. But you know what? You'll submit to sickness and you'll live in sickness and you'll even expect people to pity you for it. And that's the reason you're sick. If you had that same attitude toward adultery where you didn't like it, but after all, it's the way that it is. And this person came on to me and they tempted me and what could I do about it? You'd wind up living in adultery. But see, some of you know that's wrong. Adultery is wrong. But you see, sickness is something that, well, I'm just human. That's the reason you're sick. I expected about that kind of a response. (laughs) But it says Jesus suffered once and now he doesn't suffer anymore. And you're supposed to have this same attitude. Do you think Jesus would sit there and let a pain come on him? Do you think Jesus would deal with sickness and disease and waste away? Do you think Jesus would be poor? Do you think Jesus would be depressed? Do you think Jesus is wringing his hands and saying, oh man, I hope we get the right person in the White House. I hope we can pull this off. Do you think he's worrying about stuff? Well, you're supposed to arm yourself with the same mind. You're supposed to have the same attitude that he does. If Jesus wouldn't put up with sickness and disease and poverty and depression, why do you? And some of you are saying, but I don't have any power. You don't understand righteousness. And that's the reason that God's grace isn't reigning in your life and producing the desired results. Man, this is simple. Most of us see ourselves just in the physical. You, you know, you, if you're getting older, you say, but I mean, I'm, you know, such and such age and I just don't have the, and you see yourself only in the physical, your spirit, man, ought to be stronger than it's ever been. Yes. Moses was 120 years old. His natural force wasn't abated, nor his eyesight dim. The scripture says, according to your days, so shall your strength be. And I don't care how long you live. If you are breathing, you ought to be strong. You ought to still be hitting on all cylinders. I know some of you think I'm weird, but I think you're weird. (laughs) So this is the exact same thing that Romans chapter six was saying that Christ being raised from the dead, dieth no more. Death hath no more dominion over him for in that he died. He died unto sin once, but in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Likewise, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin. Reckon yourself to be dead unto lust, unto depression, unto poverty, unto sickness. I'm dead to those things. Those things do not have dominance over me. 
I will not live that way. Amen. Amen. I know some of you are thinking, where did you come from? (laughs) From the word. This is arming myself with the mind that Christ had. And you know, I'm not a perfect example. I still fight things and I'm still dealing with things. I'm not saying that I'm a perfect example, but I can guarantee you I'm not where I used to be. I hadn't arrived, but I've left. And I believe I'm moving in the right direction. And I believe that this is the way that, that these scriptures are telling us that we are to arm ourselves with this same mind. Philippians chapter two, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. We are supposed to think like Jesus. How do you think Jesus would respond if the doctor says, you got cancer, you're going to die? You think he'd fall apart like a $2 suitcase? We sing these songs about when we all get to heaven, what a day that'll be. And then the doctor tells you, you're going and you cry. (laughs) Something's wrong with this picture. In verse 12, it says, let not sin. Therefore, the word therefore means because of all of these previous statements, since you are dead to sin, since Jesus only died to sin once and he doesn't have to get up and die to sin again. It was a one-time deal. You are dead to sin. You don't have to get up and die to your sin every single day. Reckon it to be so since these things, let, uh, Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body. Remember Romans 5, 21, sin reigned unto death, dominated, controlled unto death. And now it says, don't let this happen in you. I am just amazed at the way that Christians feel so powerless. And they come and they tell me about their problems. And I've had this happen and this person hurt me and I'm hurt and I'm discouraged and I'm all of these kind of things. And they just act like I have no power. Would you please do something for me? And I just want to grab them and shake them and say, why don't you do something? Why do you let yourself be depressed? Why do you let yourself be afraid? Why do you let yourself be discouraged? God placed the power on the inside of you. You need to find out what you've got and who you are. And you need to stand up and say, I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. And I'm not going to live this way. And I'm going to change. And many people just are offended by what I'm saying because you're saying, well, you're, you're taking away all of my defense. You're taking away all of the things that I've used to cope with this is to make me feel like I'm a victim and it's somebody else's fault. And it's the color of my skin that I'm such a jerk. It's the fact that I don't have an education that I'm so ignorant and stuff like this. No, it's your own decisions. You may have had things happen to you that haven't happened to me, but they do not have to dominate you. I can take people from every race, from every gender, from every social economic situation, from every education background, and you can find people that prospered while other people were sitting there and letting prejudice or whatever hold them back because they were sitting there licking their wounds and feeling like I can't overcome because of what this person has done to me. Nobody can keep you down without your consent and cooperation. If criticism could kill you, I'd be dead. I've got thousands of blogs written about me and I've got people that say terrible things about me and accuse me and lie about me and say all kinds of things. And you know what? It is not going to stop me from being who God wants me to be. Some of you talk about things that have happened to you. I've had, I've been kidnapped. I've had people spit in my face. I've been threatened to be killed. I've had, I've sat down at tables and had the whole table get up and walk away and leave. (laughs) I've stuck out my hand to shake hands with people and they put their arms up like this and turn their back on me. I've had terrible things done to me and I do not sit around sucking my thumb talking about how bad it is and how people have rejected me. I've probably had more rejection thrown at me than many of you who are sitting there nursing wounds. I'm not saying these things to hurt you. I'm saying that Jesus has made you righteous. He died unto sin once. You do not have to let these things dominate you. If you were to see who you were in Christ, if you were to know how much God loves you, it just shrinks all of the other criticism down to where it's no big deal. 
You know, I had a niece that had one of these blankets that she couldn't go to sleep with that. She, every, every waking moment, she had to have this blanket with her, like Linus on the peanuts <laughs> deal. And she just went everywhere and she sucked her thumb. And I mean, until she started school and kids made fun of her. She was six years old and she still had to have this blanket and it got to where it was a problem. So my brother uh, tried to take it away and she'd just throw a fit. And so what they put castor oil on her thumb. She got to where she liked it. She liked (laughs) hot sauce, nothing slower than that. But you know what they finally did? They took this old blanket. They couldn't even take it away in time uh, to to, uh, wash it. I mean, the thing was filthy. They took this blanket and cut it in two. And she, she just held onto the blanket and then they cut it in two again and they kept cutting it in two and finally it got down to where it was this little square <laughs> like this and Tammy just threw it away and forgot it and just reduced it to where it was insignificant and she just got rid of it and it's no big deal. You know what? In a sense, the only reason all of these things bother you is because you have this attachment to it that is unnatural. It may be natural according to unbelievers, but it is unnatural according to God's system. And you are making this. And what you can do is when you get into the love of God and understand what he's done for you, it just begins to shrink these things that have held dominion over you down to where it just becomes insignificant and you can just throw it away. Oh, this person hates me. That's no big deal. Jesus loves me. You know, I've had people come out and say terrible things about me. I had a guy come up one time and just criticized Jamie over the way she dressed. And Jamie always dresses nice and there's nothing wrong with the way Jamie dresses. But she, he was a Pentecostal and he thought that she was not supposed to wear any makeup or jewelry. And he, she wasn't dressed according to his uh, religious style. And he came up and he just started redressing me and saying, you need to get your wife in line and you need to make her do this and this. And he just started reading me the riot act. And I just looked at him and I said, who died and made you God? And he just stopped and says, what do you mean? I said, you know what? You aren't God. I don't care what you think. Well, you should care what I think. And I said, you're nobody. (laughs) I said, why do I care about you? I said, God Almighty loves me and God loves my wife. And we do what we think God wants us to do. And compared to God, you're nobody. (laughs) And he got very offended and walked off. But you know, this is how I deal with all of this stuff. I know that God loves me with all of my imperfections. God loves me. And when somebody comes out and criticizes me and and it's not always unjustified, sometimes I mess up and do things wrong and say things wrong. And when I get criticized, I just run back to the fact that God, you love me. And what that does, it shrinks down everybody else's criticism to a place that it's no big deal. You know, I don't want y'all to hate me. If God made us for fellowship, he created man for fellowship. And there's something inside of every person that wants people to like them. I would like y'all to like me. But if you don't like me and if you come up and if you criticize me, I'm not going to be blessed by it. But you know what? It won't keep me awake. Because what I do is compare you to God and compared to God, you're nothing. And I just don't care about your opinion. And some of you are saying, well, I'd never do that. Obviously. (laughs) Many of you are codependent upon people. You're codependent upon their approval. You can't make it without being reaffirmed by people. That's because that's a symptom of you having a inferior relationship with God. strong statement, but it's absolutely true. How did I get off on that? (laughs) Oh, I got off on that because it says, let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body. Why do you let depression and anger and, oh, I feel rejection and pain and stuff. Why do you let these things rule? Because you don't know who you are and what God has done. If you were to ever get tied into God and understand how much he loves you, everybody else would be nothing in comparison. Jesus modeled this for us. He preached, he fed the 5,000 and the multitude, over 5,000 people came out and wanted to make him king. They wanted to take him and physically crown him and make him king. And Jesus knew. He said, you don't seek me because you love me. You seek me because I filled your belly 
he knew that they were doing it for the wrong reasons. So he began to turn around and he says, Verily I say unto you, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no life in you. And the people thought he was thinking, uh, talking of cannibalism. They misunderstood. Did you know people today who are so insecure and have to be reinforced by what everybody else thinks about them? People, a preacher today, if he was saying something like that and people thought he was talking of cannibalism, they would fall all over themselves. Oh, you misunderstood. Let me explain. And they would try and clarify, oh, don't anybody misunderstand me. When they misunderstood him and says, how can we eat your flesh and drink your blood? He says, verily I say unto you, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no life. He didn't explain. He made it worse. (laughs) And 5,000 people who are wanting to take him and make him king left. 5,000. Did you know if this happened, if we had 5,000 people here and I preached a message and it so offended people that everybody left, did you know all my minister friends would be saying, well, did you hear about Andrew? (laughs) Man, God was using him. Good things were happening, but his ministry's over. All of these people left. We judge success on people and on carnal things. Jesus knew their hearts and he ministered the truth. And when these 5,000 left, he didn't turn to his disciples and he says, oh, could you please make me, could I get a hug? (laughs) (laughs) Do you still love me? (laughs) He didn't look to them for reassurance. He just turned and he says, there's the door. Will you leave also? (laughs) And Peter thought about it and he says, well, we don't have anywhere else to go. Amen. I guess we'll stay. That really reaffirmed. (laughs) But Jesus was so secure. He only was out to please his father. And brothers and sisters, most of us are too worried about people, too tied into physical things. And and it's an indication of our lack of relationship with God. When you truly get into the presence of God, you'll get to the place where if God Almighty loves you, which he does, and if you know that, and if you're basking in his love and receiving fellowship with him, you can reach a place where it doesn't matter what anybody says about you. Because God Almighty loves you. Man, that's awesome. And if you understand this, then it's up to you whether you let sin reign, whether you let depression reign, whether you let rejection reign over you. It's up to you. You're the one that controls that. People come to God and say, oh God, please change my attitude. Please let me feel love and joy. God's not the one that made you depressed. You became depressed because you've been thinking on depressing things. I have people come to me all the time and say, I'm so depressed. Would you please pray for me? And I say, you need to quit being depressed. Oh, I can't control it. Mine is chemical. I'm bipolar. I've got this. I've got that. You're the one that controls whether you're depressed or not. I actually was prophesying to a guy one time and I said, I can tell you why you're depressed. And and he said, why? And I said, because here's how you think. When you go to bed, You think about everything that went wrong. You go to bed thinking about this. You dream about everything that went wrong. And when you get up in the morning, you start thinking about what can go wrong today. And I just started telling him things. And he says, that's exactly what I do. And I said, I know that's what you do. (laughs) He says, how did you know? Because the Bible says in Romans 8, 6, to be carnally minded is death. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace. It's like if you plant a garden, I don't have to be there when you plant your garden to tell what you planted. All I got to do is come see what's growing in your garden and I can tell you what you planted. If you're depressed, I can tell you how you've been thinking because depression is a result of negative thinking, focusing on all of the bad things. And you know what? There's plenty of bad things to focus on. If you focus on all of the negative stuff of this world and aren't depressed, something's wrong with you. You know, God made you so that you can feel depression and discouragement. To, it's like a warning. It's like when you touch a hot stuff stove. You don't have time to sit there and look at it and think about it and process it and say, this feels hot. I wonder what I should do. You just automatically feel pain and you'll jerk back 
And it's a defense recognition uh, response to keep you from being hurt. Likewise, depression. God gave you the ability to be depressed so that when you start thinking all wrong and you're focused on the wrong things, it's an unpleasant feeling and emotion that tells you red, uh, red light, something's wrong, change, stop, move in the other direction. It's an indication to you that you're focused on the negative things. And sad to say, we've lost that. We don't accept responsibility for it. And so now we think it's a medical condition and you take some kind of medication for it and feel like you're the victim and you can't control it. You can completely control how you feel by what you think about. If you thought about who you are in Christ and what he's done for you... Oh 